Ladies and gentlemen, colleagues, I'm happy to start discussing with you male infertility and assisted reproductive techniques. We know that infertility is one of the key issues of healthcare. From our health service on national, regional and global level, we know that the prevalence of women who seek for fertility is high on the territory of the former USSR. Also, this has been confirmed by our own Russian statistics. In the 21st century, we see the increased amount of infertile female in our country. This is, at least in part, due to male infertility. We see the decrease of sperm count in men in many countries on the world in 21st century. And we also know that from 30 to 50% of all infertility cases are due to male infertility. It is not easy to estimate male infertility prevalence in the society, but from Russian studies we know that it is high and it is different. It has become bigger from 2010 to 2018. Also in some areas we have not seen not a single man with diagnosis of male infertility. And we understand, of course, that this is due to the lack of standardization of approach to male infertility issue. Since we have a term of infertility based on both partners' fertility status, it's a couple's prob problem, we understand that we need a team approach for infertility based on cooperation of urologists and gynecologists. We have in our guidelines written that we must investigate both partners simultaneously to categorize infertility. And also we understand that we must include a fertility status of female partner when we decide what to do with men. But also it should work on another, another direction. When we deal with female, when we plan assisted reproductive techniques, we also must know what is a fertile status of men. But in reality, this cooperation is not always done in the right way. I have been working in the Center of Reproductive Fertility Center and we see that in many cases when female would come with a diagnosis of female infertility associated with male factors, in fact there is no male factor of infertility and this diagnosis is based solely, solely by a discrepancy with reference values of WHO and this is not correct. It has been said many times, has been written, that there is a widespread misconception that reference failures, they do not provide distinct, distinct dividing between values of normal and abnormal results. Of course, if we deal with azoospermia, if there are no sperm found in ejaculate, of course, if we deal with cryptozoospermia, where there are very few sperm, if there is 100% necrozoospermia, 100% global ozoospermia, those men patients are infertile. But if we see just oligozoospermia, astenozoospermia, teratozoospermia, if there is a lack of a few percent to normal reference values, and we do not put in mind how many sperm are there, of course we can't say that this condition is equal to infertility. This is not true. Someone might say, does it really matter if female would come to infertility center with a high rate, pregnancy rate, chance after treatment, does it really matter what kind of infertility she has? Is it connected to male factor infertility or not? But I'm sure it does, and because of psychological consequences of male infertility. Recently, it has been published a study made by Great Britain, and it has been shown that the 90% of men with infertility, they show distress, and 42% of men, they express their suicidal feelings. And from discussion with our doctors, when we meet all together, we know about successful commitments of suicide among them. Whose responsibility is it? It's just a misconception of sperm analysis. But what is not less important, and maybe even more important, if we won't see a man who is in infertile couple. We would never know what happens with his reproductive health. We don't know his lifestyle habits. We might miss his medical problems. We don't know genetic issues, issues which are important for the next generation, for his sons and daughters. We also would not have a chance to use preventive medicine, give him nutrition advice. 
tell him how to avoid environmental and occupational toxins. So any man, an infertile couple, must go to the doctor and must be seen by the doctor. I think that urologist is the best doctor or specialist in reproductive medicine, but also this check-up might be done by general practitioner using our guidelines. Easy tests like history, physical examinations, semen analysis, lab testing. He must be sent to image analysis if necessary, and then we'll understand what's happening with this patient. Some small important tips that we use with our male patients when we talk to them. Ask about time of unprotected sexual life. Some couples are really very much worried by not having pregnancy, by sexual life after three months, six months, even one month. They tell that they did their best, but they missed. How could it come? Take it easy, tell them. You need 12 months if female age is less than 35 old, years old, but after this age, six months is enough and we start examining you. Ask about coital frequency and timing. We advise to have from two to four times intercourses per week. It's an optimal frequency to have natural pregnancy. Some uh, partners think that the best time is the day of ovulation. It's also a misconception. The best chance if coitus is performed two or even three days before ovulation and you would never know what day is it. So it's better to just have from two to four times sexual activity per week. Interestingly, we recently got some new data that change our uh, understanding what is the best period of ejaculatory abstinence before IVS program. And it has been found that the best sperm is the most fresh sperm. One day of abstinence is enough to have higher pregnancy rate before ICSI. Why? Probably because of the better DNA fragmentation rate in the most fresh sperm. It has been shown that even three hours or even one hour of abstinence is enough to have the best portion of sperm and to receive the best results of assisted reproductive techniques program. But also important when talking to patients to look for factors, other factors influencing his reproductive health, both intrinsic and extrinsic. What should we ask about as well? About exposure to heat. No saunas, no hot baths. It's better to change occupation if you have occupational hazards, high temperature uh, surrounding the, the worker in, in any plant or factory. Ask about cigarette smoking. It's better to quit smoking at all. Ask about alcohol intake. One dose of alcohol per day is probably too much to have good fertility status. Ask about psychological stress. I doubt are there any who do not have stress today, but if they are, you might refer this patient to a psychologist. And it's good when a psychologist is employed in the medical center that you work in, or at least you must have good friendship connection, friendly connections with patients like that to refer patients to them. Not in the guidelines yet, but we should also ask about mobile phone, because there is the, the bigger distance from the phone to the testicle of men is, is better for his reproductive potential. Look at the patient from the point of view of obesity. If his BMI is high or if his BMI is low, refer this patient to endocrinologist and ask him to reduce weight because it's an important factor reducing his chance to get pregnancy both in natural way and assisted reproductive techniques. When you perform physical examination, check for his sex characteristics. Look at his penis, is it normal or abnormal? When you have when you do palpation of his scrotum, important factor is to palpate vas deferens. And congenital absence of vas deferens is an important factor of cystic fibrosis. And if genetic tests would show that the patient has got this cystic fibrosis, you also must check female partner and then refer the couple to geneticist and decide the need of pre-implantation genetic screening test. It's important. Also look for varicocelia. Clinically significant varicocelia might be operated if it is coincide with oligozoospermia. But a number of patients needed to treat to improve their fertility status is high. For clinically significant varicocelia is seven patients to have one pregnancy rate. And for clinically non-significant varicocelia is one patient of 17 operated. 
to my mind it's too much, but you should discuss these risks with the patient. You should also maintain cancer alertness. Actually, you might uh, see some parallels between reduced semen quality, uh, male infertility and testicular cancer. Even if we are not the center of primary care, every year we find patients with testicular cancer and the cause to come to our center was male infertility, but not any complaint. And if you found testicular cancer, this patient need immediate treatment the fastest as possible. Also, he should be told about the need of fertility preservation. In some severe cases, we do oncotise, we do tissue removal of uh, testicular tissue and send it to the IVF laboratory and then perform assisted reproductive techniques. Also, if there is testicular microlithiasis found in testicle, those patients need watchful waiting and self-examination uh, after uh, the first appearance to the doctor. If the patient has got azoospermia and low volume of ejaculate, we perform post-ejaculatory analysis. It might be retrograde ejaculation, but not azoospermia, and the algorithms of treatment of these patients are different. You also must check for urinary tract infections. Treat them when confirmed. It will improve the fertility of men and improve the assisted reproductive technique cycle um, result. Also, within interdisciplinary approach, we should refer to endocrinologist, a patient with abnormal sperm parameters, impaired sexual function, in some findings that suggest endocrinopathy. And endocrinologists would perform treatment that might benefit for assisted reproductive techniques, techniques treatment. Another interdisciplinary approach is shown with our relationship with geneticists. We have recommended by guidelines, strongly recommended by guidelines, by our guidelines, uh, tests needed for the patients who have low sperm number and azoospermia. And PGT tests will be also advised to those patients. Actually, the most um, active cooperation between urologists and IVF centra is done when the patient has got azoospermia. In cases of azoospermia, if we fail reconstruction surgery, we usually use aspiration techniques. We perform it for two, 20 years in our century and never have got serious complications. But in patients with non-obstructive azoospermia, it's more complicated case and we might retrieve sperm in about every second patient and we do open surgery also by microsurgical control. But recent meta-analysis has shown that it really doesn't seriously matter should we use uh, microscopic control or not. We also use antioxidants in assisted reproductive techniques and the Cochrane Library meta-analysis shows that leave birth is increased, clinical pregnancy is increased, but miscarriage really doesn't change. And from the quest that had been sent to doctors working in many countries, we see that almost 30% of doctors everywhere in the world would use antioxidants before assisted reproductive techniques. Even today, we do not have this recommendation in our guidelines. Experimental approach is to use testicular sperm instead of ejaculated sperm in assisted reproductive techniques, but it should be reserved for the patients who have um, previously um, uh, failures of our assisted reproductive techniques cycles, and actually it's experimental technique so far. Hormonal therapy is another experimental option. We have some promising results, but yet they are not in our guidelines. So the clear, there's a clear need for the guidelines, and we're happy to say that in Russia, our guidelines have been approved by the Ministry of Health last year. They are presented in an open way. Everyone might look for the guidelines, and they are mandatory for doctors since this year. And if the doctor would um, give medical help not in accordance with the guidelines, it will be recognized as a medical help of poor quality. So it's important. We have an algorithm in our guidelines. It's easy, it's logical. Every man in the fertile couple should see the doctor and after subjective objective assessment, laboratory and imaging test, advice from endocrinologist and geneticist, we must decide. Have we confirmed male infertility? Have we found urological cause? If no, this patient and the couple should be sent to gynecologist to consider, should we use intra inseminations or IVF or cystic reproductive techniques? But we also need to tell men at this point what is the preconception advice, what is the lifestyle, what is the diet. 
if we have found a disease and male infertility have been, has been confirmed, and then we should think, if male fertility restoration feasible, if yes, we should do that, but only in one condition, taking into account female reproductive system, func system functioning. Do we have this one year for treatment? What is the ovarian reserve of the female? If it is okay, if it is fine, let's treat men and restore his fertility and hope that the pregnancy will be achieved in a natural way. But if no, if we know from the very beginning that there is no cause found and we can't do anything for this man, let's refer him to gynecologists and think about assisted reproductive techniques instead of doing him unnecessary procedures. The indications for, indications for assisted reproductive treatments in males are written in our guidelines in a way that we might use them for many clinical scenarios. We can do it, use it in, in, very, in many cases. Our future perspectives are nice. WHO wrote and listed tests for extended and advanced examinations. They are not put in the guidelines so far, but I think the most promises is oxidative stress testing and sperm DNA fragmentation should be substituted by this test, to my opinion, soon. And coming to my conclusions, I'm sure that male infertility and infertility as a whole is still a serious problem, even in the art era, assisted reproductive techniques era. It is highly prevalent, it is ill understood. We have guidelines that provide us good algorithms for diagnosis, and we must use these guidelines to have individual approach to every couple, and also need future research to improve our skills. Thank you for your attention.